Okay, well, I gather we are ready to get started. So, let's launch. The, so, I realize this is the 26th time that I have uh, opened uh, one of our technology conferences. I think um, the, uh, uh, the first time was, was this one here, uh, long, long ago in, um, in Redwood City in 1990. But, uh, now is actually a quite amazing time for us. We've been, we've been kind of at all of this for about 30 years now. So we've, we've, been, uh, we've been at all of this for, for close to 30 years now. And uh, now is really a very exciting time for us because a lot of things that we've been building for much of those 30 years are finally coming together and uh, making really exciting things possible. Um, I, it's sort of amazing uh, that the 26th time of doing this, how can there be anything new to say? And I realize that this year I have more new to say than I've ever had before in any previous year. So I'm, I'm going to go fairly fast. Uh, I'm going to talk about a bunch of different things. Almost everything I'll talk about will be covered in some other talk, probably better than, uh, than that I'd be able to cover it. Um, but uh, the, the, I want to just uh, go over a few of the sort of uh, general things that are going on, some of the big picture of what's happening. So I'll, I'll start with, um, with uh, uh, kind of the very specific stuff, and then I'll go to more general kinds of things. So let's start with, with specifics. So at the end of last week, version 10.3 was released, and uh, that's kind of a, a, a word cloud summary of what's in version 10.3. Um, to me, it's rather impressive because version 10.2 was released only 90 days earlier. So this is kind of what, what came to the end of the R&D pipeline during that 90-day period. Um, we've uh, been really accelerating in terms of the kinds of R&D that we can do. I think we've, uh, uh, by this point, got very good processes for, for making R&D happen. Um, that are building that really make use of the automation that we've built in, in our uh, technology stack. Um, this is, uh, at this point, we are averaging about one new function per day, um, and, uh, which I consider to be rather impressive. Um, that, that, that's, uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of, the, some of what's been going on in 10.3. This was the 10.2 word cloud that came out 90 days earlier. Um, it's, uh, if you look at um, the overall plot, that's um, the number of new functions as a function of time. Um, since, uh, since Mathematica was first released in 1988, um, you can see this uh, major inflection point at version 5 back here. All sorts of things were going on then. Uh, particularly, this is the time when we really, really started to emphasize uh, using sort of the automation that we'd built in our technology and, and opened up um, all sorts of things to, to allow this kind of growth. Well, so it's, uh, it's actually... It's, I'm, I'm sort of proud of um, all of all of this continued growth over this long period of time. It's, it's great that we've been able to keep building things for this long. It's, uh, it's sort of, I think, a, um, uh, a consequence of, of sort of principles that we've had, both in terms of the technology we've built and in terms of the, the company that we've built. Um, it's, uh, it's something where uh, it's, it's um, building a... Uh, a private company like ours that's intended to just keep doing interesting things uh, for, for forever is something that has not been very fashionable in the technology world. Um, I think it's actually coming back into fashion now, which is always nice. Um, the, uh, uh, but it's been, uh, it's been a great thing for us because we've been able to just, just keep building things for, for all these years. Um, be doing both uh, sort of a mixture of systematic development at any given time and, and new stuff. It's very easy to end up with a, a situation where you're, you're, you're developing the things that you have been developing for a long time and never get to do anything new. Uh, we have sort of a, 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 a portfolio approach where we're both uh, continuing our mainstream development and adding lots of, lots of new stuff. Well, okay, so let's talk about um, the, uh, let's, I might as well talk about version 10.3, why not? Um, this is, as I say, the last 90 days of, of um, of, of things that have been done. So let's, let's take a look at a few specific things here. This is a, this is a list of new functions in, in version 10.3. Um, for those of you, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to, this is sort of, we're going to start in the specific and then we're going to build up to the, uh, uh, the bigger picture here. But let's, um, let's start off looking at some things in, in um, 
uh, in 10.3, where can we start? Well, we can, um, let's, let's, uh, let's start with something, uh, let's start with something very specific. We, we um, uh, let's see, let's bring up our new in 10.3 here. Um, the, um, let's, let's take a look, for example, there's a lot of kind of mathy stuff down here. How about, um, I actually have never tried this. Okay, so I get to try this for the first time here. Um, so we have a Gaussian orthogonal matrix distribution. And let's say we have a, a 10 by 10 matrix, and let's say we have a random variant of that type. We should get, let's see, we get a nice matrix there. That's good. Let's, let's say we do a matrix plot of that. Um, okay, there's our, there's our matrix. I wonder what that looks like at size 100. Not very exciting. But what we can do now, <coughs> perhaps is uh, uh, let's, let's do something. We've, we've worked on lots of kinds of random processes in recent versions. Um, uh, let's, let's look at this. Let's look at the matrix property distribution of eigenvalues, for example, of, um, of some matrix M, where M is distributed according to a Gaussian orthogonal matrix distribution of size 100. OK, so let's try this. Let's see if this is going to work. Um, okay, so let's say let's say we want to make um, let's say we take that, and we want to make um, a histogram of that result. So this is sort of interesting. Let's see if this works. Um, oh, what do I have to do here? Oh, I probably have to I have to say I want a random variant there. Um, up, and I need to get rid of that. Okay, there we go. So what, what's, what's interesting about this, this is a, a, a real sort of deep use of symbolic computation because what we're doing here is we're representing, we're saying this is a, um, this is a matrix M, it's distributed according to Gaussian orthogonal distribution, um, and we're going to say uh, let's, let's work out the distribution of the eigenvalues of that matrix um, and let's just sample a bunch of random variants of that kind and, and make, um, make a histogram out of those. Um, so it's sort of interesting, let's see if we can do this, I'm probably living dangerously by trying to do something that big. That's a uh, 25 million uh, element matrix that we're sampling uh, lots of times. Well, see whether it does anything. Um, so this is, so, oh, there we go, isn't that nice? I think that makes a semicircle distribution, as I recall. Um, the, uh, so, so this is a sort of core development, and again, a lot of the kind of algorithmic mathematical development that we're doing builds on many, many years, decades now, of, of previous development to make possible the, the kinds of things we're doing now. Let's, let's, try, um, let's try one other example here. Let's say, um, uh, let's try, here's, here's a, a cute example. So this is, this is building out um, some of the things that we've done in, um, uh, uh, in differential equations. So here's a, here's a polygon we've got. Let's, let's try to take that polygon and use it as a, so it's a, this should be, um, let's just see what it looks like. Um, okay, it's an L-shaped polygon here. Let's try and take that, um, that um, uh, L-shaped polygon and let's say, let's try and solve the Laplace equation um, inside the region corresponding to that um, L-shaped polygon. So we're just saying, uh, we're, we're finding the uh, eigen, this is solving an eigenvalue PDE so it's saying solve the eigenvalue PDE for Laplacian with a Dirichlet boundary condition that says this uh, uh, function is equal to zero here, where x, y is, is, uh, is an element of L. Okay, so let's see what happens if we do this. So, okay, so now what, we've, we, what we should have got now, we asked it to find six eigenvalues of that PDE um, in that region. So we've got a bunch of interpolating functions here. And now let's go ahead and say, let's make a, well, let's, for example, let's make a contour plot um, of each of those interpolating functions. So what we've done now is we've solved um, in that rather tiny piece of code, we've, we've solved the PDE in this region, uh, got the first six uh, eigenvalues there. Let's see, we can maybe let's do instead of that, let's do plot 3D here. Um, and let's, uh, let's do, um, how about we do this? Um, okay, so now what we will have got is um, the solution for the eigenvalues of the Laplace equation in an L-shaped region. Um, I guess this is a picture made famous by a uh, numerical software package that, that um, uh, has long been around. I, 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 have, I actually have no idea whether they got it right. We, we should find that out. Um, <laughs> these, are the, these are the higher eigenmodes of, um, of the same thing. Um, that, uh, 
uh, have now, thanks to all of the things that we've done in solving PDEs and being able to do uh, computational geometry and um, uh, all the kinds of algebraic analysis that go into to being able to efficiently solve uh, PDEs of this type and being able to get successive eigenfunctions and so on, uh, we're able to get that now in a rather, uh, rather modest number of lines of code and so on. Okay, so let's turn to something completely different. Um, so this is, this is, again, this is stuff that arrived in the last 90 days for version 10.3. Let's, let's, let's look at a completely different thing that arrived. So let's say we look at, um, this is some data here. Uh, this is anatomical data. So for example, let's say I say um, uh, I want to get um, uh, the mesh region corresponding to human femur. There we go. Um, so now we've got uh, a couple of human femurs here. Um, we can take this, and this is now a... Um, uh, uh, we, we have um, this for, what is it, 20-something 20, 20 thousand structures in the human body. Um, and uh, you, can, you can take this and you can say, for example, I could maybe say take the area of that um, geometrical thing, or I could go ahead and start solving PDEs um, on this uh, femur shape, um, which is kind of nice. Um, we can get, uh, let's, let's, try, let's try something, a more complicated structure, let's say, um, uh, let's take a, uh, well, we, we've got lots of properties of one of these things. If I say, um, uh, I may be living dangerously here by doing this, but let's say I do something like this. Um, I can get sort of a list of all the, all the properties that we know um, for, this may take a while. There may be a lot of stuff here. Maybe this was a mistake. Um, the, uh, uh, I think this was a mistake. I think, I think we have too much to... To, let's, oh, no, maybe not. Well, okay, let, let's, let's go ahead. They look like there are about 100 different properties, um, which include lots of different detailed things about um, uh, detailed anatomical data about what blood vessels uh, uh, come into the heart and so on. I should have picked a simpler structure, but let's, let's at least just try and get um, 3D graphics and we can get some idea of what, uh, what level of detail we have here. Um, there we go. Okay, there's a nice, nice heart with lots of different structures which one can take apart and analyze. Um, and so on. Okay, so that's an, another completely different kind of thing. Let's, let's try something completely different again. So, so we introduced a while ago um, a convenient um, uh, function, uh, Wikipedia data, which goes and um, uh, fetches, um, uh, for example, text from Wikipedia. So for example, I could, I, like I took, there's the article about computers from Wikipedia, and I, you know, this is something that I think came in in version 10 point, I, I lose track of this, it's either 10.1 or 10.2. You can just say, um, take um, uh, uh, the, the text about the article about computers from Wikipedia and make a word cloud um, from the words in that. Uh, so there we go. Um, I could also just take that article and I could say, let's, let's, let's just get from the article, let's say text sentences. Um, and then let's take the article and let's get the first sentence from it. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's do something different with that sentence. Let's say, let's get that first sentence there. And let's say text structure uh, for that sentence. This is now something new in 10.3. Um, oh, great. This may take a while. Oh, maybe not. Um, there we go. Okay, so this is now a parse tree of that sentence. Um, I could, for example, say let's take, um, uh, let's take that thing on line 24 and let's say... Um, Let's get a constituent graph from that. And now we'll have something which is the, the parse tree of that sentence, which we can then feed into our, our graph system if we want to. Um, that's actually a slightly complicated sentence. Well, OK. Um, and uh, let's, let's take that. Um, let's just, just for fun, let's just take that graph and just show, let's make something like a community graph plot. It's probably going to make a big mess from this thing. Um, but OK, there we go. That's, it's not a particularly useful thing to do for this sentence. Um, but what's interesting is that the, the parse tree that we get is just a graph structure that we can then manipulate with using all the other uh, techniques um, that we have in, in, uh, in the system. OK, other kinds of things we've got um, that were new in the last 90 days. Um, let's see what other things. Well, we've got, um, let's, let's look. We have a word list. OK, so we've got this word list. This is a list of common words in English. We have it. Um, uh, we could, um, let's say, for example, we, okay, here's the thing that we can do. So we can start saying, let's ask for a word translation. So let's say the word hello, and let's translate it into all the languages we can currently do. 
Okay, so there's a translation of the word hello. This is just this this particular system is just for word for word translation. Um, it's quite interesting to see different kinds of um, words. There's quite a few languages there. Uh, we can go ahead. Another function that's new is transliterate. So we can say um, uh, um, transliterate that. So if we do that, most languages we will have a, a transliteration into um, uh, a, a kind of romanization of these things into into um, standard ASCII and so on. Um, so that's a, another kind of um, uh, new thing. It's kind of kind of interesting to explore the, the sort of world of linguistics with this. Um, I don't think there's ever been kind of a, a we, we've been curating kind of as many languages as we can and, and more will be uh, uh, progressively added. Um, another, uh, I, I think we had added in, in, a, in a previous version things like just the alphabet. That's quite a useful thing. You know, you can get the alphabet in, in all sorts of different, um, different languages and such like. Uh, let's, let's look at another, another kind of thing we have. So let's say another function is travel directions. Um, so this is something where we're basically taking the graph of uh, the street map of the world. Um, we have kind of a, a version of the street map of the world in, um, in our cloud. Um, and so for example, let's say we could go, let's do travel directions, I don't know, from somewhere in Montreal to, let's be ambitious here. Let's go Montreal to, um, uh, this may be a big mistake, but let's try this. Um, okay, let's see which one it, that is. Uh, Santiago, Chile, okay. Um, so let's see whether we can do this. Um, so this should be now computing from the street map of, of the world. It's, it's computing travel directions. We can start looking at those travel directions. Okay, total distance 9,600 miles, total time 12 days, seven hours, etc. cetera. Um, we can ask it to show us the travel path. Um, and now that will be a, um, okay, so there we go. Uh, 65,000 points on that path. Um, let's say we can say geographics of that. Um, now I should be able to just show that travel path um, on a map of the world. There we go. Um, and uh, I think, okay, there's a ferry being taken. <laughs> there. Um, don't really know what happens in that part of the world, but um, uh, uh, but it's quite impressive that we're able to to, to do this um, uh, this computation from from this graph and so on. Um, and get the results this way. This is happening on our, this is not happening locally on, on individual machines, this is happening on a uh, server of ours um, that, that has all of that um, uh, geographic data on it. Okay, so another thing that's, that's new, um, as, as you probably know, we, we've long been able to do things like, you know, take a country, for example, and say, what is the population of that country? Um, a question is to do sort of the inverse problem. This is something that's been possible in Wolfram Alpha for, for a while, but now we're adding capabilities in the language to be able to do this. And so we say, let's say we have an entity and it's a country, and let's say we want to take, uh, we want to get the five smallest countries by population. So we can say, and I can explain how this, how this all works, we can say, um, get an entity, an entity of type country, the population is take smallest of five. Um, and if I now say, give me an entity list, um, that will explicitly give me a list of the five countries with the smallest population. Um, so just to start explaining, um, this is kind of a, a whole pattern of how things work. Um, this is, uh, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't explain this in too much detail right now. This is, this is a function, take smallest as a function that, for example, if I say, I don't know, range from 100 to 200 here, um, take smallest will take the five smallest, this is a so-called, uh, this is kind of an operator form of take smallest. One could just say take smallest of, um, uh, uh, of so range of 100 comma 200 will just make us, um, uh, here, let's just get that. So this will, this will just get us this. And now take smallest of that uh, comma six, for example, we'll get the six uh, smallest entries there. Um, but there's also a different form here where we can say take smallest of six and then apply that as an operator to what was on line 40 and get that. Um, this is kind of using a generalization of that um, in, um, uh, uh, inside the, our entity framework to basically be able to do a lookup that says of all the entities that we have, um, so for example, we could have a specific entity here that's a country, um, and we could have the specific country, I don't know, uh, France or something here. Um, this is now a way of saying, of all possible entities of type country, find the one whose population is, uh, is the, the, where, the, where you get the result of, of applying this operator takes smallest to all of those possible countries. So there's a whole new world 
of kind of ontology of entities. We, we've got um, uh, many millions of entities in our system. Um, now we're, we're able to sort of build up um, more um, uh, kind of composite entities. So for example, a typical example would be an entity instance. So an entity instance might be something like, um, uh, you know, what's the, what's the, this, is, this represents France in the year 1950. And now we could say, I think we can just say, um, uh, let's get the value, um, entity value here for population for France specifically in the year 1950. Um, so this is a way of, of taking, um, a, uh, um, uh, taking an entity and making sort of a sub-instance of it, for example, a, a country in a particular year or a particular number of grams of some material, um, all those kinds of, of ways to make uh, sort of sub-instances of things. Okay, let me show you some completely different kinds of things that again arrived in, in, um, in the last 90 days. So another thing is something called form page. Um, so uh, this, this has to do with deployment of things on, in, in the cloud. Um, so for example, let's say I say, uh, well, let's take an example here. Let's, um, uh, let's say X is an animal, and let's say we want to get, um, let's just do a simple thing here. Um, let's say we want to have um, uh, an image of that. So now what we can do is we say cloud deploy of this form page. Now we, we have had, um, and what this should do is to create in our cloud um, a, uh, a page here where we can say, I don't know, we can say, oops, that's bad misspelled, but let's see whether, come on. Connect. Oh, it managed to figure out that that was an otter. Even um, okay. So anyway, the 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 point of this is um, uh, um, that what we've got here um, is a, is a thing that's kind of if you wanted to build Wolfram Alpha in um, uh, uh, with with our language, this would be kind of the way you would do it. This is a recycling kind of form page. What we've had in the past is form functions where you where you have kind of a let me show you that where you have kind of a one shot thing where you can uh, get uh, get uh, a sort of an app produced here, um, and oh, great, um, and you you type it in, and then you just get one page back. Uh, the new thing in form page, which is just a a, a real useful um, uh, capability, is to be able to have a page that's a a recycling page where you can uh, do a computation, get a result, then do another computation, and so on. Okay, so, so also in, in kind of the, um, uh, the world of 10.3, um, we've, um, uh, we've been kind of incrementally adding um, uh, a lot of, um, uh, uh, one of the things that we've been uh, doing is to sort of incrementally add different capabilities to the language. We have kind of an internal project, we call it Incremental Language Development, ILD, and it's been sort of a, a continual process of, of trying to polish and enhance the, the sort of core capabilities of the language. So there are very, very straightforward kinds of things like, you know, there's a function palindrome Q now that just tests whether things are palindromes. So I could say, you know, select from the word list of English words, things which are palindromes, and then that's just kind of a one-liner thing to find the palindromes in, in English. Um, uh, functions like, um, uh, one general theme actually to some of these functions is, Things that used to be kind of idioms in the system, we've tried to give explicit names to. So one very common thing one does when one's writing code um, is to say, I want to print something out, but I want to get back the, um, uh, the thing that I printed out so I can keep using it somewhere else. Um, so there's now a function called echo, which will print out, print something out, and return the thing that it printed out. So when you're writing a piece of code, um, it's convenient to just be able to say, I don't know, somewhere back up here, let's find a piece of code that we wrote. Um, uh, to be able to just say someplace here, echo, uh, I don't know, we could put it in here, we could just say echo that, um, and uh, well, how about, yeah, okay. We could say echo that, and it will echo that, and then give us the, um, the result after it. Well, that was a long and silly thing to echo, but, but um, uh, you get the idea. So, so anyway, there's the sort of a, a, an effort to, um, uh, to kind of progressively um, uh, add these kind of convenience functions. One of the things that I, wh when I was first designing Mathematica, now Wolfram Language, um, long ago, I had the idea that, that um, one should design things so that, one, uh, so that one had sort of the most minimal set of primitives in the language. 
um, and that if some operations were, were done a lot, well, there would be some idiom in the language. What I realized in more recent years is that um, if there is an idiom, something that people commonly uh, use in the language, if there is an obvious name for that piece of functionality, you should just create a function and give it that name. The reason that's a worthwhile thing to do is that when you read a piece of code and the piece of code says, you know, palindrome Q of such and such a thing, you know what the intent of the person who was writing that code was. It's check whether this is a palindrome. If you see instead, you know, hash equals equals string reverse of hash, you can, you can read what that says, but it's, uh, if you understand the intent uh, from seeing the explicit name of the function, it's a much better situation. Um, now, what, there are plenty of places where there isn't an obvious name for the piece of functionality, and then the right thing to do is just to use the, the primitives that, that, uh, that we have. Um, I might mention, uh, just in terms of incremental language development, uh, I, I had mentioned take smallest um, and so on. There's a general move towards these functions that can be given operator forms. Um, so, for example, things like you know, greater than, which is something very useful in this entity framework. It's also useful elsewhere. It's, um, it's an operator version of things like uh, computing whether, whether something is greater than something else. Um, oh, here's another one that's kind of useful. This is... Um, uh, so this is a thing, um, uh, this is just a real straightforward thing, but it's, but it's a useful thing, is a text grid. This is kind of like you want to use a spreadsheet uh, within a, a Wolfram notebook. This is how you can just type things in, just like you would in sort of a standard spreadsheet. It's really, a, it's just a specialization of our grid functionality, but it's a convenient thing and it's kind of, uh, it's the, the number one reason in our company why people still use spreadsheets is because they're trying to type in tables in these spreadsheets. Now they don't have to do that because of uh, text grid. Um, here's another example. This is a, a function up to. Um, so this is something where we can say something like, um, uh, usually if we say take, you know, range of 10, and we say take 12 elements from, um, uh, from, from that, um, we'll just get some error. Um, if we say up to, uh, if, if we say up to 12, um, what will happen is that uh, an, an up to is a, is a general kind of wrapper that's being introduced into a lot of kinds of functions um, that allows you to, uh, to get, you, you can get um, uh, up to 12 elements, but not necessarily exactly 12 elements. Okay, just as, a, as an example of, of the way that things develop over, over the years, the function first, which was a function introduced in version one of Mathematica 27 years ago, the function first just got a second argument that it's never had before. And so normally, you know, when you say first of x, y, you'll just get the first element there. Um, the, uh, the question is, what happens if you say that? Well, you get an error usually, but you can actually now put in a second argument um, uh, and um, which is the, which deals with the case where uh, where there's there's no uh, there's no first element and that's that's a useful thing. Um, okay, back back to just to just to give some sense of the sort of the flow of of, of new functionality here. I might mention some things in, in 10.2 also. Uh, here's an example of something really trivial in 10.2 that's very useful. It's the um, it's it's a thing called nothing. And um, what does nothing do? Nothing just disappears. And that's useful because you can take some list like this and you can say, okay, I want all the things, uh, all the whys, I just want them to disappear. So you can just do that um, and it'll disappear. Well, a uh, lot, um, lot of other kinds of functionality that um, were introduced in 10.2. Let's see if I can bring up the 10.2. Um, the um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, Let's just give a sense of, of what was new in 10.2. Um, um, uh, a lot of new list manipulation operations to do with uh, con whether lists exactly contain other lists and so on, something, something very convenient. Um, some things to do with creating graphs and networks, um, particularly things like nearest neighbor graph. That's, that's kind of a nice thing. I could say something like um, uh, nearest neighbor graph of, um, let's say, uh, well, let's just take um, let's just take a bunch of random numbers here. So let's say random integer. Um, let's say of size 100. Let's take uh, 50 random integers here. Um, and now this will make. Oh, that's really boring. Um, oh, I, I know what I have to do. Um, so let's make for every integer. Let's make a graph of the um, uh, two nearest neighbors 
um, to that random integer. Um, so this will this is this is now forming a a, uh, a graph um, by just selecting um, selecting integers here. Let me let me make a, a few smaller here. Okay. No, oh, that's not interesting either. Um, it's got to be a good way to do this. No, it's um, anyway. So so this is this is um, something that's. Uh, 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 so an another thing that's interesting is nest graph. So nest graph is the analog of nest list, but it makes a graph instead of a list. Um, and it's taking a function um, and uh, uh, forming the graph of what happens from uh, in, in all possible applications of that of that function. Um, other kinds of things. Oh, there's simple functions like uh, regular polygon. That's a that's a real trivial one. That's that's in the category of ones which were um, have been idioms for a long time. Um, now we just have a, a function that does it in some generality. Um, another thing that was um, uh, kind of um, uh, fun that was okay. So, so another important one in, in version um, uh, uh, ten point one. Actually, it's it's not. It's still uh, somewhat experimental. Is text search. This is something for doing large scale text retrieval. Um, it's something where you can build an index of a uh, multi-gigabyte data set um, and start doing uh, text searches on it. Um, this is something that uh, is available now in desktop systems. It will soon be also available in the cloud. Um, it's something which is uh, useful as kind of a front end to doing a lot of sophisticated natural language processing. Um, uh, we've had uh, a bunch of kinds of new functions like text cases, which is a function that um, will extract uh, different kinds of entities from um, uh, from a piece of text, like you can extract all the countries mentioned in a particular piece of text, um, and so on. I mean, we could, for example, let's take um, let's take the Wikipedia entry for elephants, let's say, um, and let's go ahead and try and take at least um, let's see whether this um, uh, see whether we can get this to to work. Um, let's uh, this may take a little while to run here. Um, that. Uh, um, We'll try and extract um, all the mentions of countries from that. I think it's a fairly long Wikipedia article. Um, there we go. Okay, so this is now extracting um, mentions of countries from this particular uh, Wikipedia article. And we could turn these, we could also turn these into the canonical entities um, that correspond to those countries in, in our system. Um, another thing that, um, uh, that was added in, um, uh, in 10.2 is a thing we call code captions. Um, one of the issues with Wolfram language is that um, uh, it's, if you know English, it's, it's easy to understand what the, how the code is written because the, the, um, the functions in Wolfram language have names that are based on, on common English. Um, but if you don't know English, uh, it can take a little bit longer to, to, um, uh, to understand. And so we added a capability, let's pick one here, let's say Korean. Um, we added a capability here to annotate code Actually, let's pick a language. What's the language that a bunch of people here are going to know? Uh, French, Spanish. Let's try Spanish. U.S. That, that, um, okay. Uh, so, so what happens is now that if you select that, then any any piece of code is now annotated um, in. Um, uh, oh, this is such a. Let's delete that. Um, any piece of code is now annotated in Spanish. Um, and uh, it's been interesting to me. I, I, I happen to uh, be in China a little while back, and I switch on code captions, and suddenly people seem to be much more engaged in any talk that I give. <laughs> um, the, um, so, uh, so that's a that was a that's a new thing that that um, uh, we're, we're going to have an increasing number of languages. I think there are about 15 languages so far um, available. Um, another. Another thing that came in 10.2 is cloud submit. That's an interesting function. That's something which submits a job for execution in the cloud. So if you have a large computation to be done, you can submit it to become a task that is running asynchronously in the cloud. Um, and there are a bunch of other uh, sort of task submission functions which are, which are coming soon, actually. Another function that's sort of interesting, and in so there's a function called find formula that came in version 10.2 which is a, a, a thing for symbolically searching for a formula which is a good fit to data. Um, that sort of follows on fine distribution, um, which tries to find because sort of a, a symbolic representation for, uh, 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 for distribution of data that you've, that you've given it. Um, 
So another thing that was new in 10.2 is sort of an interesting function to, to understand. It's a thing called mail receiver function. Um, so uh, in, in our language, um, there's the notion of an API function. So if I, if I deploy an API function, let's say I say, you know, x is an integer, um, and the function is going to compute uh, the integer to the power of the integer. Okay, great. So there's an API function. Now I can say cloud deploy that, and I will get something which runs as some, um, which is a, a web API. So now I can go here. I didn't give it any arguments, but I can say question mark x equals uh, uh, x equals you know 99 or something here, and then I can do the computation, um, and I'll get back the result. Okay, so this is running an API running in the cloud, where we're initiating the execution of the API by uh, asking the web server to to do this uh, to to go to this URL. Okay, so there's another different thing you can do, and it's called a mail receiver function. And the idea there is that instead of causing something to happen by sending it to a web server, you're causing something to happen by sending it to a mail server. And so what happens here is that I can say, I can take this thing here, and I can say, uh, deploy to a mail receiver. Um, so I could say something like, um, uh, deploy here something that does the string reverse of hash subject. So what this will do is, is um, it will make a mail receiver function, which when it is sent, um, uh, when, so let me deploy this. Um, what this will do is it will create an email address. Here we go, receiver, blah, blah, blah here. Um, and if I send email to that email address, then the subject line of my email um, will be, uh, um, uh, I'll get the, um, uh, the, 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 the string reverse of the subject line of that email. So this will cause something to be executed um, in, in the cloud um, as a result of sending email. So for example, for somebody like me, I'm, I'm building myself all kinds of mail receiver functions that receive mail from all sorts of uh, uh, sources um, and then can uh, process that mail automatically to do things. Okay, well, lots of other things. Uh, you know, last year, um, we had just released version 10.0 of, of, uh, of, of our system. Um, uh, at the time of the conference last year, 10.0 was a very, very big release for us. Um, uh, we released 10.1 um, a couple of months after that, um, and it had all kinds of things in it too. Um, I'll just show you one of them. Uh, is a function called angle path, um, and so angle path is kind of uh, it's like an implementation of uh, uh, of something like logo um, in uh, in Wolfram language. So you can take an angle path and you can say graphics of line of angle path, and what this is going to say um, is uh, uh, it's going to take a path. Um, it's going to take something where we're progressively um, uh, let's do this. Um, in this case, we are. We're progressively increasing the angle. So, so if I take a very small one of these, you can see what's happening. Um, we're, no, you can't see what's happening there. Well, let's do it. Let's just do a constant here. Let's say table. Um, let's do a constant. Um, by the way, the, the, one of the new syntaxes, if you're, um, uh, um, OK, so this is, this is now a table where there's a constant angle between each successive, um, uh, each successive element. Um, if I, for example, say, um, uh, let's say I want um, uh, a range of, um, uh, let's say I'm going to increase, um, uh, I'm going to go from 0 to, um, uh, to 100 in steps of 0.1 or something. That will give me progressive increase of uh, the angle, and we get some nice picture like this. Um, this is kind of a, 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 high, a much more powerful version of the kind of thing of thinking about a turtle that's moving around, and the turtle is, is gradually is turning at each step. Um, this is just a, a, power, a power turtle type thing. Um, it's actually also useful for, for, it's surprisingly common that one's interested in having some geometrical structure where one knows that there's some particular element and then there's something else that's a certain angle to that element. Um, this is something that implements that. So a big part of the story of, of version 10, or part of the story of version 10, was introducing machine learning, um, sort of modern machine learning into our system. And we introduced the function classify, um, which, uh, whose goal is to basically be able to take arbitrary data and create an efficient machine learning classifier that can ben then be used to, uh, uh, to classify future data. Um, the uh, classify has been very successful. We've been progressively enhancing it. 
um, adding different kinds of methods, using machine learning to learn what kinds of methods to use for particular kinds of data. One of the things that we did in 10.1 was we introduced uh, the function image identify. And so what image identify does is um, to take, take an image and try and say what it is. Um, and you might have seen in, um, in May of this year, we had a website which is fundamentally just a single call to the image identify function. But let me show you that, that website. Um, so this is just a deployed version of image identify. And the idea here is we can go um, and take, uh, get some picture, random picture. Let's go to the web. Let's pick, um, let's look for a picture of an otter, for example. And let's, um, uh, let's say we go here. Okay, let's pick, a, let's pick one of these. Let's try that guy. Let's move it over here. And, um, oh, that's cool. Um, and so it will, in about 200 milliseconds, it will try and tell us what that thing is. Let's try another one here. Um, let's, uh, okay, let's see if there's something, let's see if there's an otter that's something out there that doesn't really look like, um, uh, come on, there's got to be something else other than an actual otter here. Um, I don't know, it seems like we, we have a lot of these. Um, so, uh, okay, um, good. <laughs> well, um, now this is also a, um, uh, as I said, this is also a function in the system. Let's see if I can move one of these guys in here. Sometimes these don't, let's see if that works. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so there's an image, and now we can say in here, image identify, um, and we will get, oh, it has to look, okay. The Northern River Otter, okay. The, um, we can actually, if we want to, we can, we can ask it um, in more detail. Let's, let's say we say, um, let's use image identify here, and let's, um, uh, let's, let's say we want all categories and we want the probabilities um, for different, different things. Let's see, oops, that's not what I want. I want, um, let's say, 10 of them. Uh, okay, so this is now showing us um, for this particular, okay, so it decided that the, the probability for a northern river otter is 0.54, for a river otter at all is 0.92. There's sort of a trade-off between specificity and uh, correctness. And so in this particular, the, the website actually made a different choice here than, than we made in the, in the system. Here, uh, we, we decided to make, to go for the more specific thing, even though it didn't have such a high probability of being for certain right as the more generic kind of thing. Okay, so, so image identify, uh, the fact that image identify works is really a very impressive thing. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, I, I worked on things like neural networks back around 1980 or so, and I couldn't really get them to do anything terribly interesting. And now we are, uh, whatever it is, um, uh, 35 years later, and suddenly you can get neural networks to do things like recognize, in the case of image identify, about 10,000 different kinds of objects. Um, how did this happen? Um, the basic methods are actually just the same as they were 35 years ago. What's changed is some engineering tweaks, but also computers have gotten a lot faster and the training sets have gotten a lot bigger. So for example, Image Identify was trained on about 25 million images, um, and it's, it was the original training took many uh, GPU months to do. Uh, we've now made it much faster to do training. Um, the, uh, the thing that's sort of interesting, the, the, you know, what, what's happening is we're reaching kind of a, it's impressive to humans because humans do about the same number. There are about 5,000 or so pictureable nouns, common nouns in English. 10,000 kinds of objects is, is really good for a person to be able to recognize. So it's impressive to people when we have a, a sort of an AI-ish machine that can recognize 10,000 kinds of things. The fact that we're able to do that now is pretty much a consequence of the fact that the scale of our systems is comparable to uh, at least, uh, it's, it's within the same, with the same ballpark as human visual processing. And I think that's why we're now able, as of sort of this year, uh, to achieve these kinds of successes in things like uh, 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 visual image recognition. It's sort of interesting, there have been a bunch of companies, mostly, uh, that have tried to bring out um, image identifiers in the last year or so based on the sort of uh, new technology. I think ours seems to be somewhat better than anybody else's. Um, the main reason um, is partly some cleverness in the actual machine learning part of it, but much more importantly, 
uh, a lot of uh, uh, use of curation, data curation, image curation, and so on, in providing the right kind of training and making the right kinds of decisions about things like specificity um, versus correctness and so on um, in what comes out. And so it's kind of a, an extension of the, the long-running experience that we've had in doing data curation. Now, in addition to curating data that is textual or numerical, we're curating image data, um, and that's uh, been important for making uh, an image identifier that really works well. Um, and we're progressively, uh, so we've just done cars, we should now be able to identify lots of kinds of cars. I think that's now in the system. If it isn't already, it will be by in the next week or so. Uh, we're doing, we just did uh, lots of types of food. Uh, that's interesting because it allows you to do sort of automatic nutrition computations. Um, and there are a lot of specialized image identifiers that people have been interested in us building um, for all sorts of different kinds of things from fishes to beetles to consumer products and so on. Um, and uh, this is something that has really uh, uh, become an interesting, interesting business. Actually, I might say that one thing that's coming soon, uh, very soon, we thought it was going to be in 10.3, but it didn't quite make it there, is a completely user, uh, a way where, where users can build an image identifier at least as good as our image identifier. Um, and so that's being made possible because we have a, a thing we're calling net function. Net function is a, a thing that implements uh, neural net-like system. It has about 35 different kinds of layer types for doing convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks and all the different zoos of, of sort of special functions of the neural network world. So net function is the thing that takes a given piece of data, runs it through a neural network, gets the result. There's also a function net train that takes a net function and a bunch of training data and goes off and trains the net function, adjusts all the weights in the neural network, um, to, 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 um, uh, to be able to train it. And what you'll be able to do is to say cloud submit of net train of something with some giant data set and it will go off for some number of hours and train, uh, uh, and train that net function um, and then you'll get a, a trained net function that you can then use just like you can use a classifier function um, in, in classify. And I think that will be a quite powerful uh, uh, thing for, for, for people to be able to do. Well. Okay, so it's, it's worth um, uh, remembering in, in version 10 last year, uh, what, one of the things that's happened is we, we keep on adding kind of new frameworks um, to our language. So for example, uh, associations. This is an example of an association here. Um, these were just added in version 10, and they've already become really quite central to a lot of things that we're doing in our system. Um, another thing we just added was data set, um, which is our way of handling kind of symbolic generalization of relational and NoSQL databases um, that uh, is, is, has become a really powerful way to do data science um, uh, in, in our system. Well, okay, so I, I talked a little bit about um, uh, uh, some of the things that have come in, in the last year of sort of uh, uh, specific things um, in, the, in the last year of R&D. Um, this is actually, what I've talked about so far is only really the, the small tip of a much bigger iceberg. And let me, I, I think I have to speed up here. Let me, let me talk about um, some, of the, some of the rest of the iceberg. Um, it's really, a lot of it is about re-architecting pretty much everything that we, that we do. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, the kind of the, the core of what we're doing is uh, uh, centers around Wolfram language. And Wolfram language is, is what we sort of get by taking all of those years of development of Mathematica, uh, putting it together with all of the things that we've done for Wolfram Alpha, together with uh, our cloud, um, and uh, uh, those things put together uh, make Wolfram Language, which has now become the foundation for everything we do, including, for example, Mathematica. And um, uh, in, in general, you know, we've been widely known and used in, in kind of education and research and so on uh, for many years. Um, one of the things that um, uh, people, uh, for example, at these conferences are always pointing out to us is we're not as widely used in mainstream production as we somehow should be given all the computation capabilities that we have. Um, one of the things that we set out to change uh, a number of years ago is, is that and we're getting really close to, to, to being able to do that. We've been, uh, one, one of the things we've really been emphasizing with Wolfram Language is deploying all of the kinds of computation capabilities that we have. And uh, uh, I'll talk a bit about the, the kind of different channels for deployment that we now have. 
Um, and sort of the idea here is to be able to get our technology stack to be able to be used as, as deeply as possible all across the, uh, all across the kind of technology world. Um, and I think the, the result of this is, is um, uh, kind of a, a remarkable set of opportunities. It's, it's a lot of technology that we've been building for a great many years and a lot of technology that, that many of you have also invested a lot in. Um, and I think the exciting thing is that this is now going to be very much opened up um, and able to be used much more broadly um, all over the technology world. And uh, it's something where it's pretty nice that all this new stuff that, uh, all, all the stuff that, that uh, uh, we've built and many of you have built over the years, uh, all the books that are written, all these kinds of things, it's all going to be able to be much more widely used and integrated. Um, and uh, uh, it's, um, it's exciting to see this happen. Now, I mean, there are, there are a number of frustrations that remain. I mean, the, the biggest, the number one frustration is that we're not quite ready with all of these great deployment uh, channels. We're really, really close. Uh, in fact, we'd hoped by the time of this conference to be able to show some of the more, uh, uh, some of the sort of the, the, the leading edge of, of uh, these kinds of deployment channels. I'll, I'll show you some previews of things. Uh, probably in, in, a, in a, just a matter of a couple of weeks, um, a large part of sort of our new deployment um, uh, channels will be will be ready at least in beta form, and by probably early next year they'll be ready in in final form. Uh, that's sort of frustration number one. Frustration number two is that uh, the more we the more we build in terms of our technology stack, um, the further the gap is between what the world seems to understand that we have and what we've actually built. Um, and uh, so this is something which uh, uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping that uh, uh, some of the community that includes uh, a lot of you guys can, can help somewhat um, with this process of, of trying to take uh, this big technology stack that, that we've all invested a lot in um, and uh, uh, make it more accessible to people. Well, okay, so let's, um, let's take a look at some of the things that we are doing. Let me see. Uh, is this it? That is not it. Where is... I am looking for, that's definitely not it. Um, oh, here we go. Um, so this will be the, um, some version of this will be the new homepage for our company in a little while. Um, and it kind of um, illustrates a number of things. So there's, there's a lot of stuff we're doing, but an important piece of this is kind of immediate access um, to our technology. Um, and I want to talk about some of what, uh, what's there. Um, one of the things, um, so uh, for many years now, we have been working to develop a cloud version of, um, uh, uh, of everything we do. Um, this has been a, a very, um, it's, it's always difficult when there's sort of a, a, a major change in platform um, in the world. Um, we, for, for those of you who remember version three of Mathematica and version six of Mathematica, these were both rather uh, rather complex and turbulent times because they both corresponded to times when there were sort of major changes in the, in the platforms that we got to, to use to, um, uh, uh, to run what we had. Well, the, the cloud um, is another such change. Um, it's been a, uh, I think the cloud is also probably the worst, the most jungle-like of development environments uh, for, uh, for software that I've seen in 35 years of being involved in software development. Um, so it's been quite a challenge to get everything we do to actually work in the cloud, but it does now, and it's kind of it's kind of nice that you can go to a um, uh, you can go to a, just a pure web browser, and you can be doing all those things that you do in ordinary uh, Wolfram notebooks, um, and you can just uh, uh, be doing them right here in the cloud. You can you can um, without without doing any without having any plugins or anything like that, you can just be uh, 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 doing things um, directly in a in a, um, uh, a web browser. Well, one of the things that um, is coming very soon is what we call our open cloud, um, which is a way where people can basically just go um, straight to the open cloud, just a web page, and start doing computations with Wolfram language. Um, they don't even have to register or log in or anything. It's kind of like Wolfram Alpha. You just go there and start doing stuff. And uh, we see this as being an important step um, because it's kind of opening up 
um, the, uh, uh, the capabilities of our, our computation capabilities so, uh, so that anybody can, can start using them. There, there's a, there's, you can't save stuff in the open cloud. You can't, there's a lot of stuff you can't do in the open cloud, but you can get started in doing computations in sort of the same way that, that Wolfram Alpha lets you get started doing computations. Well, there are two, two things will be available in the open cloud, uh, Wolfram Development Platform, Wolfram Programming Lab. Um, there'll be others uh, available later. Um, the open cloud, as I say, is just sort of the beginning of access to those, those systems. There's, a, there's a, a long sequence of things um, beyond what you can get in the, in, the, in the pure open cloud. But let me talk a little bit about Development Platform and Programming Lab. So Wolfram Development Platform is, uh, uh, is all about Doing, um, uh, doing software development. It's intended for people um, who want to take the Wolfram language and use it to create production software. And the thing that's exciting about Wolfram language is because of all of the, the it's, a, it's a knowledge based language where we've tried to build in, it's the world's only knowledge based language, uh, where we've sort of had the philosophy of building in as much capability directly into the language as possible. Um, and that's what we've been doing for the last close to 30 years. Um, and uh, the, the, um, uh, the sort of the other part of it is trying to automate as much as we can, trying to make it so that basically when you have an idea, when you have some sort of algorithm concept, um, it becomes as automatic as possible to get that algorithm concept uh, uh, implemented um, within Wolfram language. Well, Wolfram Development Platform is the way to take that sort of concept and um, uh, make it into a production piece of software as efficiently as possible. And so, um, the, the primary thing people will do with development platform is create pieces of Wolfram language code and then deploy them to make uh, uh, web apps, mobile apps, and so on. 